President, I have four unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session. They've approved, they have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask consent that these requests be agreed to and be printed in the record. No objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Point so. President, we know that investments in our infrastructure mean jobs and economic development now and in the future. We know as a country that in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s, we built infrastructure, highways, bridges, water, sewer, community colleges, medical research, uh, modernizing high schools, all the things we did uh, in the post-war years for five decades, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that, that the world had never seen before. And we know that American prosperity, the post-war prosperity, in large part was based on the foundation that we had set in infrastructure. Again, the, the physical infrastructure of bridges across the Ohio River connecting the, major, the, the presiding officer's state and mine uh, at, at, at Huntington and Ironton and Parkersburg and Marietta and Wheeling and, and across to, um, to Belmont County in Ohio. Uh, and we know that the, the infrastructure of building community colleges like Jeff Tech and building branch campuses at OU and and building, um, now building broadband, but, but then building, doing met, funding medical care, all those things created a long time prosperity for our country. Uh, these investments are forward thinking with payoffs that last for decades that benefit our nation, our small businesses, our workers for generations. History tells us that our nation's infrastructure has been critical to our nation's economic competitiveness and industrial strength. I mean, look, look back a few years. Abraham Lincoln created the Transcontinental Railroad. Thousands of jobs were created. Development of the American West was made possible. President Roosevelt modernized our, modernized our nation's electric grid during the New Deal. More than just electricity came to the Tennessee Valley and rural America. Americans were put to work setting the poles, stringing wire, building the, Ohio electric, the hydroelectric dams that improved the quality of life and attracted countless businesses to the region. So the infrastructure was built creating jobs, but even more so, the jobs, the, the foundation was set where many, many, many more jobs were created. President Eisenhower and the Congress established our interstate transportation system. A generation of workers carved out our highways and our roadways, allowing commerce and people to travel from coast to coast. Our nation used this post-war infrastructure boom to become the economic superpower that we are today. Public work investments, as I said, not only create good-paying, middle-class construction jobs, they spur economic development projects in small towns and rural communities and urban areas. We all know what happens when a highway comes into a community, what it does to spawn other kinds of work. They serve as multiplier effects that attract workers and businesses and foreign companies to build an American benefit from that clear competitive advantage. That's why we led the world for five decades. It's clear that when companies decide where to locate or expand or invest, that infrastructure, broadband, energy, transportation, all are critical factors in the decision. Businesses rely on solid infrastructure. Companies like Ohio's Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati recognize our infrastructure, provides a competitive advantage enabling them to ship their products anywhere in the world. Ohio manufacturers like General Motors and Honda and Smuckers rely upon our infrastructures. They operate with just-in-time manufacturing and inventory. Yet we're falling behind in maintaining that infrastructure that made us a superpower. Unsafe bridges cost lives, clogged roads and congested airspace cost billions of dollars in lost trade and productivity. Some folks spend more, tell us they spend more time commuting than they, are, they, than they spend at home with their family. We're seeing a 19th century water and sewer uh, a bunch of 19th century water and sewer systems failing our 21st century cities. Meanwhile, more and more people depend on these services while cities and states can't meet demands. Where states face budget problems that make these investments difficult and in some cases delayed indefinitely. And then there's China who is fast becoming one of our chief economic competitors, building more roads, more better airports, faster railroads, and faster rail systems than we are. Why would we let that happen? No one in this Congress, nobody, and in state legislatures, as Senator Shaheen said earlier, uh, should be proud of the condition of our roads. No one in this Congress should be proud of the fact that the world's newest airports and train stations are being built somewhere far from our shores. There remains an unwillingness here, though, Mr. President, that I, I'm just... I, I'm still incredulous. There's a, there's a, a fundamental unwillingness here 
to make the sort of investments necessary to improve our nation's infrastructure. I guess we've got to cut taxes more for rich people instead of asking them to pay just a little bit more and put that money into infrastructure. Historically, infrastructure has been bipartisan. I've heard some of my colleagues say well, this week there's no such thing as a Democratic Republican bridge. But it seems like there is now because we see time and time again some of my more conservative colleagues saying, no, we're not going to spend money on infrastructure. We're not going to do that. Let me show you a bridge where um, I've been many times, driven across it, uh, seen it from Cincinnati. Uh, this is um, from the Kentucky side, correct? This is called the Brent Spence Bridge. The president was there um, not, not, not too long ago. I was not with him that day, but I've been on that bridge many times. Uh, the Brent Spence Bridge was named after a congressman, I believe, from, from Kentucky in the 1960s, early 1960s, late 1950s. This was inaugurated, I believe, by President Kennedy, uh, President Eisenhower. What's that? Oh, President Johnson. Sorry, President Johnson. So it, with the, the bridge construction began and came later. It carries, it's I seven. this is I-75 through Cincinnati, going from Kentucky to Cincinnati, uh, into Dayton, if you could follow it all the way north, uh, and then into Toledo and ultimately into Detroit. And this bridge carries billions of dollars worth of freight and millions of drivers across the bridge. Someone said this bridge accounts perhaps for as much as 4% of our gross domestic product cost crosses this bridge going either north or going south across this bridge. But today, the Brent Spence Bridge is one of 15 that the U.S. Department of Transportation has deemed functionally obsolete. The Brent Spence Bridge is not alone. You can see uh, there is no real space here for a, a, if a car breaks down. There's no, not much of a way to get, get or, or someone has a heart attack while driving or all the problems that can become. This is, a, this is a major, major, major bridge across one of the most important rivers in this country, the Ohio River. A recent study of our nation's infrastructure found there are more structurally, get this, more structurally deficient bridges in the United States than there are McDonald's restaurants. Think about that. There are 14,000 McDonald's restaurants, but according to Transportation for America, there are 18,000 deficient bridges and 70,000 70, structurally deficient bridges. From a public safety and a commerce perspective, fixing the bridge is a necessity. The largest hurdle remains financing. Under the President's proposal we'll be voting on this afternoon, more than $60 billion completely paid for would go toward road and bridge construction, fixing our airports and transit systems. It would make our roads and our skies safe for transportation. It includes a national infrastructure bank that would fund infrastructure projects of regional or national significance by, like this 50-year-old, almost 50-year-old bridge. It would mean Ohio and Kentucky could obtain uh, it, would, it would mean that increasing private sector infrastructure lending, the National Infrastructure Bank, could couple federal loans with private equity, ensuring a partnership of public and private sector that meets local needs. For the Brent Spence Bridge, it could mean Ohio and Kentucky would get necessary funding to complete the project ahead of schedule to create jobs and protect the public safety. I mean, Mr. President, we, we've got to do this. We've got to renovate our and, and update our infrastructure. Why wait? Interest rates are as low as they've almost ever been. Uh, so finance and, and construction costs, because there's so much competition among construction companies to get work now, are as low in historical times, perhaps, than they've ever been, as they've, as they've ever been. And we need this work now because of the unemployment situation. So, and, and we will benefit from, fix, from replacing, fixing this bridge uh, for years into the future. For freight rail investments in Columbus, it would mean reducing the bottlenecks that prevent goods from moving across the country. For airports, it means reducing congestion, improving runways. On our rivers, like the Ohio River, it means fixing locks that slow barge traffic. In Lake Erie, the other end of my state, uh, lake Erie, the lake that made such a difference in the settlement of, of Buffalo, although it's also lake, uh, uh, lake Ontario there, Buffalo and Cleveland and Ashtabula and Toledo. We know what these great lakes have done for our economic development in our country. It means fixing these, these ports. For all of our states, it means jobs, it means economic development. It's about a construction equipment manufacturer in Peoria selling equipment to the contractors working at the port of Toledo. It means it's about dock workers loading American-made steel in Ohio grown, grown soybeans for exports to markets around the world. That's what this bill's about. 
It's about jobs now. It's about setting the table for jobs in the future. We know that. Republicans and Democrats alike know that. Yet Republicans, speak, I guess because they want to see Barack Obama fail, that's what the Republican leader has said repeatedly, and don't, I don't understand that, but that's what he says. And the bill's fully paid for. The bill before the Senate's funded by a very small tax on people making over a million dollars a year. If you make a million dollars a year, your taxes won't go up. The second million, you'll pay a little bit of money on the second million you make. So this isn't in any way going after small business. It's just saying to the people that have done well, you got to pay a little more money. It's common sense. It's the American way. We ask those who have benefited the most in our nation, many of them on Wall Street, many of them on Main Street, but people that have done very, very well, we ask them to make this investment. We know that it's, it's infrastructure that has helped people make lots of money in this country. Without infrastructure, many of these companies that have never would have been successful. World inf world class infrastructure is how we move goods across the country and export around the world on our trucks, on our rails, on our barges, on our airplanes. It's how we get to work and school. It's, it's how we attract businesses. It's how we protect the public health through clean water and sewer systems. So President, this will create jobs immediately, good paying middle class jobs. These jobs provide workers with health care and retirement, exactly the kind of jobs that you welcome in Wheeling and Charleston and Beckley and I welcome in Portsmouth and Cleveland and Akron. These jobs enable people to buy a home, to save for their children's education, to plan for their future. These investments not only create the construction jobs that we need, putting money in people's pockets that they'll spend in the community, they also create manufacturing jobs in steel and cement and all kinds of materials. They also create long-term jobs as companies grow because they have better infrastructure. Mr. President, this is about rebuilding our infrastructure. It's about rebuilding our middle class. I ask my colleagues to support this legislation later today when we vote on it. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Arizona. I'd like to speak about an issue that I and most Americans, I believe, find extremely troubling and one that I've been seeking to have properly addressed for many years now, namely the outright corruption and blatant abuse of the American taxpayer that's been taking place at the hands of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for decades. Since they were placed in conservatorship in 2008, the two government-sponsored enterprises, GSEs, i.e., supported by the taxpayers, have soaked the American taxpayer for nearly $170 billion in bailouts. And this morning, the Associated Press reported that Freddie Mac has now requested an additional $6 billion to uh, continue their so far, in my view, failed efforts. I quote from the Associated Press, government's controlled mortgage giant Freddie Mac has requested $6 billion in additional aid after posting a wider loss in the third quarter. Freddie Mac said Thursday it cost $6 billion in the July-September quarter. That compares with a loss of $4 billion in the same quarter of 2010. The government rescued McLean-based, Virginia-based Freddie Mac and sibling company Fannie Mae in September 2008 after massive losses on risky mortgages threatened to topple them. Since then, a federal regulator has controlled their financial decisions. Taxpayers have spent about $169 billion to rescue Fannie and Freddie, the most expensive bailout of the 2008 financial crisis, the government estimates it will cost at least $51 billion more, at least $51 billion more to support the companies through 2014, and as much as $142 billion in the most extreme case. Freddie and Washington-based Fannie owner guarantee about half of all U.S. mortgages are nearly 31 million home loans worth more than $5 trillion. Along with other federal agencies, they backed nearly 90% of new mortgages over the past year. 
the two mortgage giants buy home loans from banks and other lenders and package them into bonds, da 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 da. So, here we are. They've lost $140 billion we've spent. Uh, no, they've spent $169 billion. Now they're asking for $6 billion more. And so, what do we find out? Uh, that Fannie and Freddie now will dole out big bonuses. I am not making this up. The Federal Housing Finance Agency, the government regulator for Fannie and Freddie, approved $12.79 million in bonus pay after 10 executives from the two government-sponsored corporations last year met modest performance targets tied to modifying mortgages in jeopardy of foreclosure. The executives got the bonuses about two years after the federal giants received nearly $170 billion in taxpayers' bailout. And despite pledges by FHFA, the office tasked with keeping the solvent, that it would adjust the level of CEO level pay after critics slammed huge compensation packages paid out to former Fannie Mae CEO Franklin Raines and others. And I might add that these huge bonuses and packages that were given to Mr. Johnson, Mr. Raines, and many others, which there is clear evidence of, was done by cooking the books. Not a one of them has been held accountable in any way, shape, or form. Securities and, Secu and Exchange Commission documents show that Ed Haldeman, who announced last week that he's stepping down as Freddie Mac's CEO, received a base salary of $900,000 last year, and yet took home an additional $2.3 million in bonus pay. Records show other Fannie and Freddie executives got similar Wall Street-style compensation packages. Fannie Mae CEO Michael Williams, for example, got $2.37 million in performance bonuses. That's after the taxpayers paid $160 billion. That's where they're on the hook for another $6 billion, and God knows how much more. And so we are giving these individuals $900,000 a year salary, millions of dollars in bonus pay, and who in the world is the Federal Housing Finance Agency to award these bonuses. I mean, uh, it's hard, it's hard. FHFA Acting Director Edward DeMarco, and I must admit to my colleagues, I had not heard of Mr. DeMarco, told Congress last year that the managers who were at the helm of the mortgage companies during the market collapse were dismissed, but also argued that generous pay helps lure experienced, qualified executives able to manage up to upward of $5 trillion in mortgage holding. Whatever happened to asking patriotic Americans to come and serve and help homeowners, homeowners out of this crisis? Whatever happened to patri patriotic Americans who would serve and, and help the nearly half of the homeowners in my state of Arizona whose mortgages are underwater? DeMarco told lawmakers he's concerned that suggestions to apply a federal pay system to non-federal employees could put the companies in jeopardy of mismanagement. Could put the companies in jeopardy of mismanagement and result in another taxpayer bailout. They just asked for $6 billion more. He said the compensation packages at Fannie and Freddie are part of the plan to return them to solvency while reducing costs to the taxpayers. A March report by FHFA, obviously ignored by Mr. DeMarco, their inspector general said, the agency lacks key controls necessary to monitor executive compensation, nor has it developed written procedures for evaluating these packages. In other words, the beat goes on. Business as usual, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I, it's, it's unconscionable. It's been proven time and time again that Fannie and Freddie Mac are synonymous with mismanagement, waste, outright corruption, and fraud, and their federal regulator has the audacity to approve $12 million in executive bonuses to people who make $900,000 per 
year. This body should be ashamed if we let this happen, especially in these economic times. Every day, more and more Americans are losing their job and their homes, and we're allowing these people to take home annual salaries of $900,000 and bonuses of millions of dollars. All the while, they ask the taxpayers for $6 billion more today. You know, it's come to my attention that some of my colleagues are writing letters, calling for committee hearings on this issue. Letters are fine. Hearings are fine. Hearings are great. They're not the answer. The answer is for us to stop it from happening, and we can do that with an amendment on the pending appropriations bill. And I'll be offering an amendment, and I hope all of my colleagues would join in. Let me just bring the attention of my colleagues a book called Reckless Endangerment. It's written by Gretchen Morganson and Joshua Rosner. And the title of it is How Outside Ambition, Greed, and Corruption Led to Economic Armageddon. So we're talking about pay and, balance, uh, pay and bonuses. And I read from the book. Because bonuses at Fannie Mae were largely based on per share earnings growth, it was paramount to keep profits escalating to guarantee bonus payments. And in 1998, top Fannie officials had begun manipulating the company's results by dipping into various profit cookie jars to produce the level of income necessary to generate bonus payments to top management. Federal investigators later found that you could predict what Fannie's earnings per share would be at year end almost to the penny if you knew the maximum earnings per share bonus payout target set by the management at the beginning of each year. Between 1998 and 2002, actual earnings in the bonus target differed only by a fraction of a cent, the investigators found. Investigators uncovered documents from 1998 detailing the tactics used by Leanne Spencer, a finance official at Fannie, to make the company's $2.48 per share bonus target. That year, Fannie Mae earned $2.47.64 per share. Mid-November, memo to her superiors, Spencer forecast the company was on track to earn $2.4744 per share just shy of what was needed to generate maximum bonus payments to executives. Look, this, this story goes on in this book. It goes on and on. How the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac executives intentionally ripped off the American people, describing uh, 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 profits in a way that was totally false, getting tens of millions in bonuses. This is a government-sponsored enterprise. Mr. Johnson bailed out with $100 million or so of, of taxpayers uh, of, of bonuses. In 1999, Johnson joined Goldman's board, stepping into a highly lucrative position that offered rich investment opportunities overseen by the form, firm and opened doors for Johnson around the world. In 2000, the Gordon, Goldman board position paid Johnson 50000 not uh, counting stock awards. With Brokerage firms like Goldman Sachs f flourished from the fees generated by underwriting securities issued by Fannie and Freddie, with fees totaling $100 million a year. And guess who came on Fannie's board? Mr. Johnson. Johnson was still on the board in 2010 when the Securities and Exchange Commission sued the investment bank for securities fraud related to its sale of a dubious mortgage security. By that time, Johnson was earning almost $500,000 for his work on the Goldman board. The accounting fraud at Fannie went undiscovered until 2005, when an investigation by OFHEO unearthed it in a voluminous, intensely detailed 2006 report. OFHEO noted that if Fannie Mae had used appropriate accounting methods in 1998, the company's performance would have generated no executive bonuses at all. A lawsuit filed by the Securities and Exchange Commission in 2006 said the company's 1998 results were intentionally manipulated to trigger management bonuses. Although a highly kept secret at the time, Johnson, this is Mr. James Johnson, Johnson's bonus 
for 1998 was 1.9 million, investigators determined. It later emerged that the company had made inaccurate disclosures when it said Johnson owned a total of almost 7 million in 1998. In actuality, his total compensation that year was like $21 million, OFHEO said, referring to an internal Fannie Mae analysis it had turned up. So one of the great scams in American history is going on, and the people responsible for it have never been held responsible, have never been held responsible. I refer to my colleagues taking a look at this book. And I, and I recommend taking blood pressure medicine before you read it. Now, here we are, business as usual in Washington. The approval rating of Congress now down to 9%. As I've said continuously, we're down to paid staffers and blood relatives. Why are they, why are they not happy with us? Why haven't we solved the housing crisis in America? Why is it that half the homes in Arizona are still underwater, worth less than their mortgage is. But while the financial institutions on Wall Street have doing it just fine with record profits, and Fannie and Freddie continue to act as if they did nothing wrong. And to add insult to injury, after, ask, ask, after a third quarter loss of $6 billion, they're going to get millions of dollars in bonuses. Mr. President, I, I may be a bit of an idealist, but I'll bet you that there's some patriotic, talented Americans that would be willing to serve on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac without being paid $900,000 a year and million, millions of dollars in bonuses. I really believe that. I really believe that. And yes, people are sitting in around the country, and yes, I don't agree with a lot of their agenda. But when they read of things like this, they're that their anger is justified. Their anger is, they have every reason to, uh, to, to be justified. Already, $170 billion in bailouts. This morning, an additional $6 billion. And yet, the American taxpayer is told that they're making progress? And who has been held responsible at these organizations, at these government sponsored enterprises that were responsible for this. To my knowledge, Mr. President, no one. So it seems to me, it seems to me the least we can do is cancel these bonuses, make sure it doesn't happen, and maybe ask for some qualified, experienced, talented Americans to come in and take over this agency. And the first guy that I think ought to go is the guy that approved of these mortgages, who I understand is, I mean, the, the, that approved of these payouts, Mr. Edward J. DeMarco. Mr. President, I yield it. Mr. President. Senator from Delaware. Mr. President, I couldn't agree more with the senator who just spoke that we are in a situation where the all-time approval rating of this body seems to have reached an all-time low. And there are justified reasons for the frustration, uh, for the anger of a very broad run of our constituents, of the folks who hired us, Mr. Senator, to come here from our states of West Virginia and Delaware, from Arizona and others, to try and fix the problems confronting this country. And much of the mess, much of the things that got us in this problem have not been solved. But I rise today to speak about one way forward out of it. And I think one of the reasons why there is so much frustration with Congress and the general public is there is broad support for some simple solutions to get Americans back to work, to revive and strengthen our economy, that we just seem incapable of reaching across this partisan divide and moving forward. One of those is an infrastructure bank. I, I rise today to follow up on a speech I gave yesterday about why investing in American infrastructure means investing in America's future. Infrastructure, building roads and bridges, highways and sewer systems, modernizing America's backbone, enjoys very broad support from all across the United States, from all different sectors, because Americans understand it will put folks back to work in the building trades industries that have taken the hardest hit in this recession, and in a way that will lay the groundwork for our long-term future competitiveness. 
This is smart spending. This is investing in the best tradition of federal, state, local, private partnerships to make America more competitive for the future. Today I want to talk about one element of the bill, which I hope we will move to later today. The American Infrastructure Financing Authority, or known, known more colloquially as the National Infrastructure Bank. If this idea sounds familiar, it's because it's already been introduced. It's a bipartisan bill, the BUILD Act, championed by Senator Kerry and Senator Hutchinson, of which I'm a co-sponsor, and one that provides a creative financing vehicle for building infrastructure going forward. As you know, Mr. President, before becoming a senator in the election last year, just a year ago yesterday, I served for six years as the county executive of Delaware's largest county. And one of the things our county was responsible for was running a countywide sewer system. We had 1,800 miles of sanitary sewer, and it was a constant challenge to maintain. That's a lot of pump, a lot of pipe, a lot of pump stations, and a lot of sewage backing up in people's homes in the middle of the night, which led to a lot of aggravated calls from constituents. It was an aging system, like so much of America's infrastructure, one in which we had underinvested for too long. And from personal experience, I can tell you that the lack of that infrastructure, of adequate sewer capacity, was a major barrier to future growth. So too across states and counties and cities all over this country, where the roads and rail, the ports and the sewer systems aren't up to current global standards, we can't expect to grow to meet our global competitors. When we talk about capital infrastructure improvements at the local level in the government I used to be with, it wasn't some wish list, this wasn't some future technology, this wasn't some risky investment, it was triage. It was critically needed investment in pipes in the ground that would protect our water, strengthen our community, and grow our economy. As a nation, the American Society of Civil Engineers has told us we need $2.2 trillion over just the next five years in infrastructure investments to keep America moving forward. We're talking about fixing unsafe bridges, dealing with clogged highways, and rebuilding airports so they can handle larger, modern aircraft safely. That is an enormous scope, Mr. President. $2.2 trillion over just the next five years. We're already asking so much of the Super Committee in terms of finding dramatic savings, reductions in federal spending. Where will this level of investment come from to put America back to work? So in my view, we have to get creative. We have to leverage. We have to bring in more resources than are currently on the field. And especially now, especially in this country, I think we have to be smart about how we spend our funds. The Rebuild America Jobs Act, to which I hope we will be moving later this afternoon, would put $50 billion directly into infrastructure, but $10 billion as a down payment into making possible this new infrastructure bank. Seed money that makes possible loans and loan guarantees, not grants, for a wide range of infrastructure projects, including energy, water, and critically needed transportation. Remember, we need more than $400 billion a year in investment right now just to keep up. But we all know that the constrained budgets of our county, state, and local governments can't get the financing they need. This infrastructure bank would provide the leverage, a vehicle to finance desperately needed projects. Just a few things about it. It would be for big projects, projects that cost more than $25 million in rural communities, $100 million uh, in the rest of the country. It would only be allowed to finance up to 50% of a project to avoid crowding out private capital to make sure that private capital's got skin in the game so it's a viable project. It's my expectation, in fact, that the infrastructure bank would finance a much smaller piece of most projects, just enough to bring private investment to the table. It would be government-owned but independently operated, have its own bipartisan board of directors and function, much like the successful Exim. An infrastructure bank passed by the Senate this week could provide up to $160 billion in direct financial assistance over its first 10 years to infrastructure for transportation. And that would be paired with private investment that could double, triple, or even quadruple, increasing the full impact of this bank. I said yesterday, Mr. President, that infrastructure is a smart investment for our country, that a national infrastructure bank, as a part of that strategy, would provide a vehicle for the private sector to get in on this investment as well and to help us accelerate our move towards the future. This, Mr. President, is smart policy. It's a funny thing about infrastructure, how we inevitably take it for granted. Whether you're running a state highway system or a county sewer system, you never know how much people miss it until it isn't working the way they expect. And unfortunately, in cities, counties, and states across our country today, companies, 
and communities are discovering that our aged infrastructure is imposing costs on us that we just can't bear. The American Society of Civil Engineers, which I've referred to before, recently released a study saying our nation's deteriorating surface transportation infrastructure alone results in the loss of nearly a million jobs and will suppress our GDP growth by nearly a trillion dollars between now and 2020. That's an enormous loss of future economic activity. In my view, we can't put this off any further. As a country, we can't keep swerving to avoid these potholes on the path to prosperity. Eventually, we're going to hit them. And eventually, they're going to continue to be a drag on our nation. The Rebuild America's Jobs Act would fill these potholes, would patch these pipes, would lay the new runways to allow America's economy to take off. In my view, this Rebuild America's Jobs Act, which would rebuild 150,000 miles of roadway, maintain 4,000 miles of train track, upgrade 150 miles of airport runways, restore critical drinking water and wastewater systems, is nothing short of the smart investment we need to be competitive for the future. It would put people back to work, it would steer us on the right road to sustain recovery, and it would fix the problems that lie right in our path as we try to do our jobs, Mr. President, for the folks who hired us to come here and help them get back to work. We need to act today, and it's my hope that my colleagues will join us this afternoon in voting for the motion to proceed to the Recover and Rebuild America Jobs Act a critical piece of which is this smart infrastructure bank. Mr. President, I move now briefly to support the nomination of Richard Andrews, who has been nominated to be United States District Court Judge for the District of Delaware. Rich Andrews is an exceptional lawyer, a dedicated public servant, and a good man. When the Senate confirms his nomination, hopefully later today, Rich will become the fourth active judge serving in the District of Delaware. This will mark the very first time in five years that this very busy court will operate without a vacancy. For a small district like Delaware, albeit one with such a specialized and complex caseload, even a single vacancy places a significant burden on the court. Mr. Andrews' nomination has been pending 177 days. And while I am grateful for the consent agreement that I hope will allow his nomination to be considered today, I remain concerned that such a non-controversial and qualified nominee is rich could take nearly half a year to reach floor consideration. The judicial vacancy rate hovers near 10 percent. There are 31 judicial emergencies, and it's my hope that this body will continue to move expeditiously to fill vacancies throughout the country. As a member of the Judiciary Committee, I had the chance to chair the nominations hearing for Rich and to take part in the committee's consideration of his nomination. I've reviewed his record, listened to his testimony, met with him personally, conferred with my senior senator, Senator Carper, and as a result of all this, I assure my colleagues, I have every confidence, Rich is a qualified judge and will serve Delaware and this nation brilliantly. During his 30 years of service for Delaware so far, he's established himself as a talented, dedicated, and humble public servant who possesses a strong work ethic and the highest integrity and intellect. He began his service to our state when, after graduating from Berkeley Law School, he came to Delaware as a law clerk for Chief Judge Colin J. Seitz of the Third Circuit. Luckily for us, he never left. After completing his clerkship, he joined the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Delaware, where he spent the next 24 years, much of it serving as the first assistant U.S. Attorney and Chief of the Criminal Division. He has tried, in that role, more than 50 felony jury cases and argued 17 cases before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Since leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office in 2007, he has served as State Prosecutor for the Delaware Department of Justice and leads more than 70 Deputy Attorneys General in the Criminal Division and has overseen tens of thousands of prosecutions each year. I'm confident then, Mr. President, that his experiences as a prosecutor have given him the knowledge, skills, and temperament to join and serve ably on the District of Delaware federal bench. When I chaired his nominations hearing, I was impressed at his professionalism, his intelligence, and his demeanor. Rich enjoys broad bipartisan support, having been reported unanimously by the Senate Judiciary Committee. So, I urge all of my committees to join me and Senator Carper in supporting Mr. Andrews so he will have the opportunity to continue his selfless service to the people of our state and our nation. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Florida. I ask a unanimous consent that I be recognized to speak as of in morning business. 
Without objection. I also ask unanimous consent that the senator from Rhode Island be uh, recognized immediately after me. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, I wanted to come to the floor today for a moment and introduce an issue that I've become interested in over the last few months, one that, quite frankly, I didn't know a lot about before I came to the Senate, and it's the issue of human trafficking and slavery. Uh, for many Americans, for many of us uh, in the 21st century, we think of slavery as a concept of the 19th and 18th century, something that happened in other places and a long time ago, when in fact it exists even today around the world. The, the issue is actually pretty startling. The State Department estimates that there's between 700 and 800,000 people in the world each year that are trafficked. Uh, the number of people trafficked in the United States is about 16 to 17,000. That's a lot of people in the 21st century that are being trafficked and are, and are held in, in bondage. And I saw a special on a cable network recently that outlined it and outlined this issue and then started researching on it. I was shocked to learn that my home state of Florida is particularly affected by this issue. So recently I had the honor and the privilege of being appointed to the Helsinki Commission, the, the, the group here in the Senate that, that works along with the House as representatives, as commissioners on that commission. And we held a hearing yesterday on the issue of human trafficking. And it's an issue that I'm going to be increasingly speaking about over the next few weeks because I truly believe it's one of the great humanitarian causes of this new century. And it begins with awareness, with a clear understanding of what's happening around the world with regard to this issue. The fact that there are these people, as we speak, as I stand here today, perhaps within walking distance of this very building, there are people held against their will in servitude. Now, the one that gets all the publicity, and rightfully so, because it's so painful to think about and so outrageous, is sex trafficking. Children and young girls and young women that are brought into this country against and, and held against their will as sex slaves. It also happens all over the world. It's sad to learn that there are actual governments around the world that cooperate with this and tolerate it and are corrupted by it. And, and that gets a lot of publicity and attention, and we're going to be paying a lot of attention to that. We heard stories of, of diplomats that work in this city, diplomats from other nations who come here and bring uh, domestic workers with them to their homes and hold them here against their will and, and take their entire paycheck. And we're going to be denouncing some of those people on this floor by name in the weeks and months to come. But the other thing that was shocking, although, the, as I said, the, the sex trafficking gets a lot of attention, is the forced labor aspect of it. People that are recruited in other countries and they're brought here and they're told, we're going to bring you to the United States, you're going to come here, and you're going to make a living, and you're going to make some money, you're going to be able to send it back home. And when they get here, they're held against their will, they're not paid. In fact, sometimes they owe the traffickers money, and they're held in squalid conditions. And that's happening right here in this country underneath our very nose. This is an and now, not to mention the egregious cases around the world, and we're going to focus on those cases around the world as well. The State Department, by the way, ranks every country in the world on the basis of how much they cooperate in the progress they're making on prosecuting and investigating these issues, and, they, and those tiers are available to you. A report came out recently, and it identifies the countries that are doing well, the countries that are trying to do well, and the countries that, quite frankly, couldn't care less and actually don't mind this stuff going on in their jurisdiction. And they deserve to be condemned, not just on this floor, but in the international community. And we'll talk about that as well in the weeks to come. But I don't think we can point the finger at anyone unless we look at ourselves as a nation and as a society and call attention to this issue. So as I begin to introduce this issue and my involvement in it, there are a couple things I want to point out from yesterday's hearing. The first is that this, this is largely occurring as a result of criminal enterprises. The same people that traffic drugs and, 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 and involved in all other kinds of organized crime are also involved in human trafficking. We see that increasingly in major areas and we've seen prosecutions. But we've also learned that increasingly what we're finding are small-scale operations, sometimes families. We heard the case of a mother and her two sons who were involved in a human trafficking ring. And it's very profitable, very lucrative. It costs them about $10,000 to bring a young woman into this country and they can make that money back in the sex uh, trade within a few days, and after that it's all profit. And it's outrageous. And it's opened the door for small-scale operations that are doing this. What are the impediments to dealing with this issue? There are a few, and they're going to take a long time to work on. But the first, unfortunately, is a lack of recognition. I think uh, at the local level, and even at the federal level, our law enforcement officers and personnel who want to do the right thing probably need some more information about identifying these cases seeing the, the, the markers of human trafficking, identifying cases that clearly uh, reek of human trafficking, and identifying those and treating them as what they are. 
The second thing we need are better protections for these victims. You know, you're not going to be able to prosecute people and put them in jail unless the victim is willing to testify. And victims aren't going to testify they don't feel secure. If they feel you're going to deport them or put them in immigration jails, or worse, if they think that these organized crime rings are going to harm their family members overseas, it's going to be very, very hard to get victims to cooperate. And last but not least, and I know that this is a complicated issue, but our immigration system is contributing to this. We have a very complicated immigration system, and it's an expensive one, a burdensome one. And what it's creating is the need for middlemen. And guess what? More often than not, unfortunately, nowadays, the middlemen, these foreign labor agencies, too many of them, are in fact human traffickers who are utilizing this system, the legal immigration system, to bring people into this country, and once they're here, to hold them against their will. We've got to focus on that, because ultimately that has to be solved. Our legal immigration system has to be modernized. If it isn't, if it isn't, one of the problems that we'll continue to face is this issue of human trafficking. Now, the good news is, here in Congress, there's a bill that's a reauthorization of the, uh, of the TVPRA. Uh, it passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee in October of this, month, of, of, in October of this year by a 12 to 6 vote, and it does a few things. It promotes increased cooperation among the federal agencies uh, between the United States and other countries, it and it supports and it enhances the victim-centered approach which basically says we're going to approach this from the viewpoint of the victim and create protections and security for the victim and their families so they can cooperate, so they can help us prosecute these people. And the bill focuses on cutting off human trafficking at its roots by supporting international efforts to, tra to, to focus on this. And there are a lot of countries out there that want to do the right thing. They either don't have the resources or the knowledge base to do it. And there are some countries out there that don't mind this. In fact, they cooperate with this stuff. They like that it's going on in their countries. They're on the take, so to speak. And they need to be called out for what they're doing as well. And finally, it promotes accountability. It ensures that the federal funds are being used for their intended purposes. And, and it reduces the authorization levels to address fiscal concerns, but focuses on the programs that have been most effective. And so my hope is that that bill, which is a bipartisan bill, will come to this floor soon, that we'll have an opportunity to, to, to make it better, to get it passed, to work with our colleagues in the House, to send a very clear message that this is a priority, that this is something we should all agree on and work together on. It is a great cause to be involved in. It is one of the great humanitarian human rights causes of the 21st century. And I think how we deal with it or fail to deal with it will say a lot about us as a people and as a nation. And I hope that I can encourage as many of my colleagues as possible to take this cause up as their own. And I look forward in the weeks to come uh, to be able to come on the floor here and talk more about it. And with that, I yield the floor. Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I rise in support of the Rebuild America Jobs Act because it responds to two critical needs, the jobs crisis that uh, we face throughout this country and the need to improve our national infrastructure, which is obvious to everyone in every part of this country. Over the four years of this economic crisis, the unemployment rate in Rhode Island has been one of the highest in the nation, and it now stands at 10.5%. For many families, it has been a stressful and demoralizing time. Very few have avoided the impacts in their own lives or in the lives of someone else close to them of this economic crisis. It has been particularly devastating for those involved in construction, a sector where more than 2 million Americans, including 7,000 Rhode Islanders, have lost their jobs since 2007. It's frustrating for these workers because all around they can see the need to maintain and improve our infrastructure, which, by the way, is essential to the free flow of commerce and the economic prosperity of the country going forward. Indeed, all of us, regardless of our economic status, benefit from a sound transportation system. A few weeks ago, Senator Whitehouse and I joined Rhode Island transportation officials at the Providence Viaduct. Now, this is, now this is a 1,300-foot stretch of Interstate Route 95 that runs through directly through the heart of Providence, Rhode Island, our capital city. It connects New York and Boston and the whole north-south uh, highway system on the east coast. It's one of 155 bridges in our state alone that have been found to be structurally deficient. It must be replaced within the next few years. It no longer can be repaired time and time again. It has to be replaced. 
If it's not replaced, then traffic will have to be rerouted, which would have a major impact on our econ economy and the regional economy. Route 95 is a highway link between New York City and Boston. If suddenly in the middle of that highway link you effectively put up a roadblock or restrict traffic to one lane, you are going to see economic activity throughout the Northeast affected. Already the Rhode Island Department of Transportation has installed wooden planks beneath the viaduct to catch falling concrete or debris that may fall on cars or pedestrians below. And that's an example of just the first signs of the increasing decay. Now this is the kind of common sense project that this jobs bill addresses. But it's not the only one. Indeed, 21% of Rhode Island's bridges are listed as structurally deficient, while ne nearly 30% are functionally obsolete. There's a huge amount of work that we can do to improve existing conditions and make us more productive going forward. For Rhode Islanders, passing this job bill would translate to 100, approximately $141 million of highway funding to help us respond to these obvious needs. Moreover, it would provide approximately $21 million in transit funding, which would provide a real shot in the arm to help maintain an efficient public transportation system. We take pride in Rhode We have a statewide transportation system. It's oriented around our, our bus system. It travels the length and breadth of the state. It's, uh, it is very efficient, but it needs support. And this bill would help provide the support. The bill would also improve airports, uh, particularly our major airport, TF Green, with a safety uh, facilities and an expansion of a runway. It would make air travel not only safer, but it would make our airport more capable of intercontinental and international service. And right now, we don't have that effective option. If we did, that would be a huge multiplier to our economy. And it's based on sound infrastructure improvements. These are not new, novel techniques, new, advanced technology. This is old-fashioned, extending a runway, fixing a bridge, getting the economy moving again. Everyone understands that. Everyone on you know, Main Street and East Street and South Street and West Street and every corner of this country understands that. And we've always done it, and this bill will help us do it. Now, finally, the bill establishes a national infrastructure bank, which I believe can play a, a critical role in financing these projects going forward. And these projects would include clean water projects, energy projects, as well as transportation projects. And there's absolutely no doubt that these investments in infrastructure will benefit our economy. According to the economist Mark Zandi, every dollar invested in these types of projects will generate approximately $1.59 in economic activity. There's a significant multiplier effect here. And it's part, I think, of importantly getting us moving again, building up self-sustaining momentum. Again, these projects will go and employ private companies that will hire individuals in all of our home states to begin the work that must be done to improve our infrastructure, to provide the kind of vital transportation links that are critical to any economy. And it's also very important to note that this proposal is fully paid for. And you have both business and labor supporting these investments in the bill. And I would hope we could all join together in a sign not of common, just common unity, but common sense and adopt this provision. Build infrastructure, it's paid for, it puts people to work. That's what the American public is asking us to do, and we should do it. Now, I want to comment briefly on the Republican alternative proposal. It, it, it fails to provide the investments to deal with these infrastructure and job crises that we face today. In fact, it, it does the op opposite. It effectively cuts $40 billion in discretionary funding without addressing the needs of our highway trust fund and other infrastructure improvement vehicles. And more importantly, it would scale back important public health protections under the EPA. The, Republican package includes the so-called EPA Regulatory Relief Act, the RAINS Act, and the Regulatory Timeout Act. Together, these provisions not only threaten our economic progress, but also our public health. And they would nullify, for example, the EPA boiler rule. Now, this rule has been 
calculated to produce 10 to 24 million dollars in, or 20, 10 to 24 dollars in health benefits for every dollar spent. Uh, at least a 10 to 1 ratio in health benefits versus dollars spent. Preventing approximately 6,600 premature deaths and about 40,000 asthma attacks per year. And this translates again into another major crisis we face and that is an affordable health care system. One way is to make the, the system affordable health care is to prevent premature deaths asthma attacks, a host of other things. And that's not incidental to what environmental protection does. That's at the heart of environmental protection. Finally, the, the proposal places basically a moratorium on all regulations, including financial regulations. And we have seen, uh, sadly to our chagrin, the effect of lax regulation in 2008 when our financial markets were on the verge of collapse. Unless we have effective regulation, unless we can effectively deploy the new tools provided under the Dodd-Frank Act, unless we can resource regulators to keep a watchful eye on the marketplace, frankly, we're going to once again relive uh, those very, very dark and daunting days of 2008 when we saw markets on the verge of collapse. And we do so, frankly, in a global economic environment where there's pressures coming from Europe, there's pressures coming from around the globe, economic pressures. If our markets aren't strong, well regulated, ask ourselves, can they withstand the backwash from a crisis in Greece, a crisis in Italy, a crisis across the globe? So I do believe that the legislation that uh, has been proposed by Leader Reid, uh, proposed essentially by the President, makes sense. And I hope we can unite in common purpose to do what is in common sense, invest in bridges and roads in America, fully paid for, and avoid the diversion of this alternate proposal that essentially will impair our health, the public health of America, and not really advance our financial stability as a nation. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor, and I would also note the absence of the quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.